One of the things that I really like about the field of language and language acquisition in particular is that it really touches on these deep questions about human nature. And welcome everyone to Slater Pod. Today we're really excited to have Stephen Piantadozzi on the podcast. So Stephen is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of California in Berkeley. Hi Stephen, thanks for joining. Hello, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So where does this podcast find you today? What country, what city? Are you in Berkeley? I'm in Berkeley, yeah. There you go. Nice. I don't enter the world for me. So first, let's start with a bit of a scene setting introduction. So tell us more about your lab. You run a lab called Kulala Computation and Language Lab, and maybe expand a bit about your role at Berkeley and how it intersects with, with language. Yeah. So um, my lab is is really interested in uh, two main topics. Uh, the first is language, um, so language processing and, and language acquisition. Um, specifically, we're interested in, in how kids take the kind of input that they uh, receive and learn the kinds of abstract rules and structures and concepts and things that you need for language. So we're trying to develop uh, formal computational theories of, of how that process can happen. Um, and that's very exciting to us because it's it's very interdisciplinary. So it draws on uh, linguistics and computer science and neuroscience and um, uh, experimental psychology. Um, so we're trying to put all of that together into some kind of picture uh, that can explain kind of early language and, and early concepts. Um, the second topic we study is numerical cognition, um, which I actually got into through language. So uh, kids learning of words like one, two, three, four, um, learning of a, a counting system or arithmetic, um, and we do uh, some computational modeling work there, some uh, experimental psychology, just trying to understand the basics of how uh, numbers are you know, understood and, and represented. Um, and we also do some field work. So we work with a South American indigenous community to try to understand the role of formal schooling in uh, number acquisition. So um, yeah, it's an ex ex exciting kind of combination of uh, each of those, uh, each of those kind of topics. Exceptionally exciting and, and fascinating, absolutely. So I learned about your work uh, when you published a paper recently on large language models, kind of bought as possible umbrella there, and it had quite an impact. And in the paper, you say that LLMs are not just impressive, they're philosophically important. Now, can you expand a bit on why you think so? One of the things that I, I really like about the field of, of language um, and language acquisition in, in particular um, is that it really touches on these deep questions about human nature, right? So uh, what kinds of things need to be innate for humans have to be just built in genetically to en enable us to not only learn language, but learn all of the other um, conceptual domains and cognitive abilities that, that we know. Um, and those kinds of questions about human na nature, um, I, I think are, um, well, I, I should say they're, they're also deeply re related to questions about human uniqueness, right? So um, as far as we can tell, no other species can learn human language or anything kind of remotely as complicated as, as human language. And so if we're really un interested in understanding what makes people the way that they are, then uh, language is a really good place to, to look for that. Um, and of course, in language acquisition, there have been um, decades of uh, debates and competing theories about uh, what kinds of things need to be there. And um, um, the uh, kind of main, I guess, thesis of, of that paper is that large language models have, have really changed, uh, changed the landscape for theories there. So for a long time, for example, it was thought that language learning was just impossible without there being uh, substantial innate constraints. So people even had very kind of mathematical arguments that, that would try to say, uh, you know, you, you mathematically could not figure out the right grammar from the kind of input that, that kids get. Um, and therefore, some pieces of that grammar have to be present innately. They have to be encoded for us genetically, whatever that means. Um, and that argument in particular, I, I, I think, um, uh, has been really refuted by large language models because they show that um, you know, if you give enough text, they're, they're able to identify um, a really competent grammatical system, probably more competent than our existing linguistic theories, um, uh, from just observing sentences and, and, uh, and input data like that. So um, it's probably not the case that you sort of need to mathematically be, 
uh, uh, be provided with pieces of, of that grammar, the right kind of learning system is, is able to uh, discover the, the key pieces of grammar. Now, if some of the listeners think this sounds familiar from a conceptual point of view, it's because they might have come across the innateness kind of theory in their, you know, translation studies, uh, linguistic studies, uh, and of course, the grandfather or father of it all would be Noam Chomsky, right? And so the title of your uh, uh, paper was quite provocative. Uh, it was actually called uh, Modern Language Models Refute Chomsky's Approach to Language. So quite the title. And let me just quote from the, from the abstract as well. He said that the rise and success of large language model, as you already pointed out, now undermines virtually every strong claim for the innateness of language that has been proposed by generative linguistics. Modern machine learning has subverted and bypassed the entire theoretical framework of Chomsky's approach, including its core claims to particular insights, principles, structures, and processes. Now, can, can we just revisit, can you help us revisit Chomsky's kind of key paradigm and how it maybe has shaped linguistics for decades. I mean, a lot of the listeners here would, if they re remember anything from linguistics, it's probably the name Chomsky, right? So can you just help us kind of understand that first? And then we go into why you think that LLMs kind of refute and undermine that, that theory. There's a couple of, of key interrelated ideas, I think, with Chomsky's approach. Um, um, so uh, one of them, for example, is is that in a grammatical theory, um, we should be finding kind of discrete systems of rules, right? So you can think about a rule that might say something like put the subjects before the verbs, right? Or put the objects after the verbs. Um, and uh, those kind of discrete rules, I mean, in, in the paper, I have a one or two quotes from Chomsky talking about, for example, how probability is completely useless. So there's nothing uh, probabilistic or stochastic or gradient in, uh, in grammatical systems. Um, and um, that's a, another example where um, large language models uh, work in a completely different way, right? So they have a continuous space of neural network weights and they use uh, gradient descent, right? So, so they they compute derivatives um, with respect to to their parameters um, in order to to tune those parameters and make them do a good job of predicting data. So, there's nothing like the the kind of discrete rules that uh, that Chomskyan theories um, uh, propose inside of these. And in fact, the both the probability part and the gradient part are probably very very important for making these models work well. So, um, if you want to um, uh, optimize a model out of uh, a, a optimize model with lots of parameters, for example. Then um, this is the the main method that people have figured out for for how to do it. Um, so I think that that maybe at the most basic level, the underlying representations end up looking really really different, right? You have a grammar which is somehow encoded into the weights of a neural network um, compared to a system of kind of logical rewrite rules or or something. Um, um, there's other kinds of assumptions which which also I think differ differ uh, fundamentally. So for example, um, since the the 90s, one of the main features of Chomsky's approach has been trying to find um, kind of small minimal sets of rules and principles which can explain language. And um, he talks about that as a kind of defining feature of of his approach. I think it's actually probably not that not that unique in in the sense that scientists generally try to find simple rules and and principles. Um, but in particular, um, um, uh, his uh, his approach to to linguistics um, often tries to minimize the amount of say memorized stru memorized structure, right? So trying to derive as much as possible um, from the the rules. Um, and if you think about people, right, so, so people are very good at learning words, for example, we know tens of thousands of different words, and we also know tens of thousands of different idioms, right, I idioms just have to be memorized because we know their, their meaning and we know their, uh, their linguistic form and the two are not, the, the, the meaning is not derivable from the linguistic form, right, so like kick the bucket is, has a meaning which is not, um, not derivable from the words. So we're very, very good at learning little chunks of, of language like that. Um, and actually large language models are, are similarly also good at that. So they're not seeking, in Chomsky's sense, a minimal set of rules. They're very happy to, to memorize data, to, to memorize idioms or, or little pieces of language. Um, and one of the, um, I, I think, kind of remarkable findings of um, kind of deep learning and, and modern language models has been that uh, 
uh, there exist statistical models which, which are good at memorizing data, but also good at generalizing to new data. So for a long time, it was thought in uh, kind of statistical approaches that if you had a model which had too many parameters, uh, so many parameters that it could essentially memorize most of, of what it sees, um, it wouldn't be good at, at generalizing, meaning extending to, um, say, sentences or image categories or whatever outside of its, uh, its training set. Um, and deep learning tools, for whatever reason, are, are, seem able to, to do that. Um, and that means that, that you can have things which uh, um, aren't kind of explicitly seeking minimal sets of logical rules, as in Chomsky's theory, um, uh, but instead are, are very good at, at memorization and also very good at generalization. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that, that those uh, two pieces together are are uh, kind of most of the advance. And if, if you think about like what a uh, linguistic theory should look like, um, um, uh, I, I think that large language models, you know, come at this question from a, a, a completely different point of view and, and end up doing uh, really, really well on pretty much any task we can find for them, right? So uh, they're good at syntactic tasks. They're, they're uh, reasonably OK at, at some kinds of basic reasoning tasks. Um, uh, they're good at translation. They're good at, at answering questions and you know writing computer code and, and all of that kind of stuff. So I, I think uh, from that starting point, which is differ different than Chomsky's, they're able to uh, exhibit um, a, a, a much wider and kind of more powerful uh, set of, of language abilities. And I think in your paper, you also you just mentioned um, that you the concept of outside of training data, right? And I think it was important for you in your very first example in the paper, you said that you tested uh, ChatGPT's abilities with this uh, and could sink an aircraft carrier uh, example to demonstrate that, you know, you have to be very careful to make sure that you test it on things that are clearly outside of any training data. Can you just tell us a bit more about how you prompted uh, ChatGPT at to yeah, get outside of that training data um, realm. This has actually made um, uh, kind of working with these models kind of fun, right? So they're trained on huge amounts of text from the internet. Think billions and, and billions of tokens. You know, everything in Wikipedia, for example, a lot of comment threads on on different sites and and whatever. So um, that means that if you ask them um, a really common kind of question, right? If you ask them. Um, to uh, maybe say what it would look like to dig up an anthill, for example, um, there might be text on the internet that contains that information. And so if they provide it back to you, then you have to worry that they're, they're just repeating something they've already seen, right? Because we know they, they have this, this ability to, uh, to memorize chunks, um, chunks of language. Um, uh, and this means that, that to, to really test them, you have to ask them questions which are really unlikely to have been encountered before, even on the entire internet. Um, and so um, uh, it's kind of fun. It takes a little bit of creativity, I think, to, to think of things which are outside of, outside of the box of uh, the entire internet. Um, uh, one example from, from the paper is, is that. So, to, so um, I had asked it to describe how an ant could sink an aircraft carrier, right? And um, it comes up with this story about um, uh, one ant kind of rallying together all of the other ants and uh, coming up with a scheme to sink an aircraft carrier. Um, and, um, you know, if you look for, for that text or text like it on, on the internet, um, there, it really isn't there. So um, what that says is, is that it's able to um, generate coherent discourses um, just from a little prompt like that far outside of its training set. Um, the other one in the paper was uh, um, asking it to explain the fundamental theorem of arithmetic um, in the style of Donald Trump, right? And so that's just a, a fact in, in number theory that you can factor a number down into its, its prime factors. Um, and um, it, they're very good at imitating style. And so it, it gave this speech that, that uh, was very reminiscent of, of Trump saying things like, you know, Believe me, I know a lot about prime numbers and and that kind of stuff in there. So um, that's also uh, uh, certain to be outside of its its training set, and yet it's able to put those pieces together in a in a coherent and and sensible way.
So then maybe some critics would still argue that it's just simply kind of a, a sequ an endless sequence of predicting the next token, right? And that's how it comes up. It just kind of takes the most likely next like solution. And then sometimes it actually, I was told, uh, it kind of has to deviate a little bit um, from this to make it creative. So you would think that uh, that argument wouldn't count. It's not just predicting, like it's not just an endless sequence of predicting the next one, but there is something else going on there. Yeah, so I mean, it's certainly true that for for many or most of these models, um, uh, their training consists of being able to predict the next token in in language, right? So um, they see some some string, and then they're asked what the next word is going to be in that string. Um, and when you ask them to answer a question like that, um, what they're doing is predicting the language that would follow that question. So explain the fundamental theorem of arithmetic in the style of Donald Trump. Um, uh, they're um, taking that text and then predicting word by word what, what the next likely word would be. And that happens to be a, um, a description of the, of the theorem in the style of, of Donald Trump. Um, so uh, I think it's true that they're working like that. I think where the, the interesting debate is, um, is uh, what e exactly does that mean, right? So um, how, how I think about it is that uh, if you were doing a really good job of predicting upcoming linguistic material, what word was going to be said next, um, you'd actually have to have discovered quite a bit about uh, the world and about um, language, right? The, the, the grammar. So um, if you think about these models as having lots of parameters and kind of configuring themselves in a way in order to predict language well, um, uh, probably what, what they're doing is, is actually configuring themselves to represent some facts about the world and some facts about the dynamics of language, right? So for example, if, if you gave it a prompt that, that said something like, um, you know, you walk into a fancy Italian restaurant, what happens next, <laughs> right? Um, well, you know, it will just predict the next word. It'll probably give you a plausible description of, of that scene, of, of what the, the next events are going to be. Um, but if it knows that you're going to be handed a menu and shown a table, right, it, it only knows that because it has uh, um, internally represented the relationships between, you know, words like restaurant and words like menu and table and the sequential progression of events like that. So it's built some uh, at least approximate little model of what's happening in the world. Um, and that model is encoded implicitly somehow in, in all of these billions of, of neural network weights. Um, so um, I, I think of this word prediction as, as just a, a kind of description of its, uh, of its training setup. Um, but I think one thing that's been very surprising, um, even to people in, in AI and, and certainly in, in linguistics and cognitive science, is that from that kind of prediction, you're able to discover uh, lots about language and probably also lots about the world. When we go back to maybe it wasn't a controversy, but you certainly probably got a, a bit of pushback on Twitter and in, in some of these debates that I saw on YouTube, like what are the different camps and do you think it's just an adjustment and some people adjust faster than others and others just cling on to like, you know, the, the past four decades of obviously, you know, literature and, and research, like wh where do you see this going within the linguistics community, for example? I mean, my own view is is that it, it really changes pretty much everything in linguistics, right? So the reason for that is is that there just haven't been models that work this well in anything, right? So um, if you look at, for example, a uh, generative syntax textbook, you know, it'll have hundreds and hundreds of pages about, um, you know, what the the likely structures are underlying language and uh, little arguments about why it's this structure and, and not this other structure. Um, but the problem is that um, uh, many of the approaches there start from the same set of basic assumptions, right? So they start by trying to find some small set of discrete rules. Um, they don't start from, um, uh, you know, kind of gradient continuous probabilities and uh, kind of rich ability to, to memorize things. And so um, what that means is that most of those theories, I, I think, are probably not going to last very long, right? Be because they're, they're just from the wrong starting points. And they're from starting points that people had uh, decades to work on um, and that you know, didn't that decade, those decades of effort didn't produce anything close to the abilities that these models have. Um, so, 
um, I think of them as, as really changing the starting points and the, the core underlying assumptions of, of how we think about uh, you know, what it means to represent a grammar or what it means to, to represent linguistic knowledge. Um, and from my point of view, that's great, right? That, that, that's a, a real advance in our, in our understanding and our, our way of, of thinking about things. Um, and like I think pretty much everything in, in science, those kinds of advances um, uh, really necessitate um, uh, moving past the, the prior theories, right? Um, uh, moving to the, 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 next, the next theory that, that works better. It must have been very hard to falsify any of these theories in the past. I mean, how, are you, how, how can you disprove that we don't have discrete rules in our head as humans, right? So maybe that, and now we have a model that does it, clearly not in the way that a human would do it. Um, but can we maybe just uh, dwell on the question, like how or in what ways does kind of an LLM differ from a human in generating information, like in, in natural language, like clearly there's something I mean, there's something very, very generative going on with, with these models, right? And like, do you think we're, it's, it, is it too early to even like fundamentally assess the difference or how, well, so I'm rambling a bit, but like going back to the, how humans generate, can we get insights about how humans generate language and information from what we're seeing now playing out with the LLMs? I guess that's mildly more coherently put. I think both of the, the, those questions are, are really good. So um, for the first one on, on the differences, um, you know, one difference that, that a number of people have pointed to is that um, we seem to have a variety of different modes of, of reasoning, um, many of which are probably not, not accessible to these models. So for instance, you can uh, picture a 3D scene and reason about it, right? You could picture the Italian restaurant I, I brought up and, and you know, come up with a hypothetical guess of, of where stuff would be laid out and, you know, whether there's a candle on top of the table or underneath the table and, and kind of think through, think through things on, in, in that kind of geometrical way. Um, you can also reason about about different entities, right? So, um, um, you know, if you, uh, uh, well, I guess both both reasoning and and planning, right? So, so if I asked you, um, uh, you know, how to get to the airport or like like what what the sequence of steps is that that you would need for for doing that. Um, uh, probably your your knowledge of, of that is is quite rich and richer than than even a large language model would would have. Um, so um, I think of one of the, the main differences is that they're they're mostly just doing language. Um, but that there's like a lot in that word mostly because um, um, they are able to solve certain reasoning problems. you know they, they can maybe play a chess opening <laughs> or, or, or something just based on on kind of the statistical patterns of, of data that they've that they've seen. So um, uh, I think this is one of the other things that's been surprising is that just training on language seems to give them some of the the information about the world um, and kind of how, how the world is is structured and they're able to internalize that. So they, they could for instance tell you how to get to the airport, but if you ask them, um, you know, more complicated questions, um, you know, let's say that, that on the way to the airport, your taxi gets a flat tire or something, um, what should you do? If you keep making things more and more complicated, um, you'll probably run into some wall with their, their reasoning ability and their ability to keep track of all of the moving pieces. Um, so um, this is something, um, both of the, those aspects, I, I think, are, are, are things that people are currently working on. So trying to integrate these kinds of linguistic abilities with um, uh, other kinds of uh, kind of cognitive reasoning mo modules that that people seem to have, um, um, uh, you know, it, it's uh, that that I should say is is even a, a debate in the in the literature about whether that's even necessary, right? So um, uh, there's some people who think or or maybe thought that. Um, uh, you wouldn't need anything other than than just this this kind of general class of, of model, right? So like if we just gave them enough data or the right kind of data, um, maybe they could learn to develop reasoning or learn to, to reason and think about objects and physical scenes and, and these kinds of things. And um, uh, there's lots of evidence that they have some ability there. Um, and it's, I think, kind of unclear still um, 
uh, how much ability they have or, or how exactly it compares to people. Probably it's it's kind of a coarse, fuzzy version, coarse, fuzzy model of the world that they're developing um, and um, not as, as kind of sophisticated as the one that, that people get. Yeah, no, there's one thing also, the data size issue, right? I mean, these uh, models have been trained with like, I think we're in the, you know, 500 billion uh, kind of reach now and you know, some argue that there's even bigger ones but there's also something I think I, I came across in your in your writing or a, a baby LM <laughs> and so basically training the models on like from scratch on human sized amounts of linguistic data so what is human sized amounts of linguistic data and what, what's the challenge in, in training the baby LM? This actually re relates to um, uh, one key weakness of, of the current models that, that I haven't haven't uh, touched on here, um, uh, which is that they're trained on much more more data than people get. So um, this has been one of the the kind of primary responses that that people have said um, about the article. Right, is like okay, these aren't actually relevant to human language learning because maybe they get a hundred or a thousand times as much data as a, a human kid gets. Um, and there's uh, two, I think, main responses to that. So, so one is that um, these models are very, very new, and we we don't actually know how much data is necessary. So it could be that that there's a nearby architecture, so something kind of like the the existing models, but maybe with a little twist or a, a certain kind of recurrence or something that um, uh, that allows them to to learn what they need from much, much less data. Um, uh, the second thing to, to say is that um, uh, probably a lot of that data is just going in, to, is not going into to learning the syntax, the, the grammar of the language. Probably a lot of it is going going into learning either the semantics of the language or, or the, these other kind of semantic aspects of, um, uh, you know, learning about the world and, and kind of uh, structures and, and things in the world. Um, and so if that's true, it, it could it could be the case that um, uh, uh, learning grammar and, and language is, is not so hard, um, uh, but learning kind of semantics and meaning and about the world takes lots and lots of data. Um, and of course, hu human learners are in a very different situation than large language models in that they're getting independent data about the world, d data that's independent of language from, uh, you know, interacting with the world or interacting with, with um, other people in the world. So um, uh, that's kind of, you know, how the, the data issue, I think, is, is relevant to these questions about whether the models have anything to say about what, what human, human learning is actually like. Um, the Baby LM Challenge is, is this, this really exciting um, project where um, uh, people are, are uh, kind of competing to see uh, whether you can train a model like this on human-sized amounts of data. I believe, the, I believe human-sized is something like 10 to 100 million uh, tokens. Um, and you know, if that's roughly the, the amount of, of data that you get in childhood, then it's really important for us to know uh, whether it's possible uh, to take that amount of data and learn syntax, for example, uh, or to develop other models which uh, are able to, to learn syntax from, from uh, that, that size data. Um, part of why baby LM is a thing is, is that the, um, you know, these, these kind of current models like um, ChatGPT, for example, are developed by AI companies who don't really care about human learning and, and language acquisition, right? They're just trying to, to build a useful product. And so they don't really care about the uh, scaling with respect to, to the amount of data. Um, if you're interested in these things as language acquisition theories, then you really care about the amount of data, um, because if it takes a trillion tokens or whatever, then then um, that's that's not going to be, not going to be plausible. Um, but many people are optimistic. I think that that it can be done with much less. But like, couldn't you argue that like maybe you said between ten and a hundred million um, uh, tokens, right? But like for for a, a human, so that's a lot less than these models, right? Um, but there's all these other kind of multimodal information that a child will get. I think you even mentioned it, right? I mean, so you ask your mother and then she actually reacts in a certain way and like you're, you're looking at it. So there's like visual input that is not necessarily uh, linguistic. So is that taken into account here at all? Or like we're just kind of separating the linguistic component out? In Baby LM, I believe you're, you're able to include um, multimodal information, if you want. So you, you you could have a learning model, for example, that watched you know a thousand hours of video um, and tried to learn about events and event structure in the world like that. Um, 
And, um, uh, you know, I think in general that that's very hard, right? Because you can imagine trying to make the statistical learning model, which could take a thousand hours of video and learn, you know, that there are objects or, or that, you know, objects sit in certain spatial relationships or something like, and it, like whatever kids know about uh, objects and, and the world, I, I think is, is a, it's a very hard task to extract that from, uh, from video. Um, but I think that, that that that's what most people think is going on with with child acquisition, right? So kids don't don't require uh, you know 100 billion tokens um, be, because uh, you know they're they're in a situation where they can learn a, a word from a single instance, right? You hear the word Dax when there's a kangaroo around, and and you figure out that Dax means kangaroo, and um, uh, that that kind of, of learning mechanism can be very fast, um, both on the the syntax and the and the semantic side, um, and that kind of experience is not what these language models have. Um, and so some people take that and and say, well, that that means that they're irrelevant to language acquisition. Um, other people like me take it and and think like, okay, it means that. Um, probably we can make versions of these models which work with much less data um, and which are therefore much more directly relevant to kind of real world, real world learning. Fascinating. I'll follow the baby LM challenge and understand now it's very good that you put this in context that this is actually very important for like your part of the linguistics uh, feel like because the amount of data you put in is so crucial to, uh, to kind of the overall arching um, uh, kind of conclusions you're taking from it. Let's bring it back to Jomsky. Um, I find it interesting that he's taking somewhat of a Luddite position on this, because like in a, in a New York Times article, and I, I'm going to have to quote a bit here, he's saying that like while AI uh, tech like ChatGPT may have some practical uses, he actually mentions language translation and information retrieval, they're not capable of true understanding or consciousness. And then he says, it lacks the embodied intelligence and perceptual experience that humans possess. He says that it's tech for profit and efficiency and may ultimately lead to greater inequality, job displacement. And finally, he kind of urges a more critical and thoughtful approach to AI development. Now, from an industry perspective, like I wonder is how relevant are any of these questions when LLMs are being shipped like, and it's basically a trillion dollar market opportunity. I, I'm not sure, like you're kind of sitting in the middle, like you're criticizing him from an academic point of view, but also from an industry point of view, I wonder if like, what, what's, what's the point of making these points in a sense, if it's happening anyway? I think I, I probably agree with him a lot on the uh, kind of ethics issues. Um, so um, for example, when you, when you train on text from the internet, you're, uh, there's a lot of horrible things on the internet, and um, these models, even even ChatGPT, at least the the, the early versions, right, had um, uh, you, you could extract horrible things from them. Um, and from an industry perspective, that's very bad because that if you want to rely on that, um, if you want to rely on that that kind of technology, right, you need to be able to trust that it's not going to say say horrible things or exhibit. Um, uh, you know, illegal biases, for for example, or immoral biases. Um, so um, uh, I think that there's there's lots of questions and concerns there. There's also lots of questions and concerns about, for example, misinformation. So um, people have pointed out that uh, when you have models like this, they're they're kind of the perfect tool for spreading misinformation or you know trying to influence elections or other kinds of things, which I think were. Um, um, you know, you could see at, at Facebook, for example, um, you know, everybody thinking it's a social media, <laughs> a friendly social media site, and then, uh, um, you know, political groups being able to hijack the, the advertising um, uh, and to, to really push around um, elections. Um, and, um, you know, I think that there's lots of uh, uh, kind of unintended and likely still unanticipated consequences like those. So, um, I, I think there's there's lots to be worried about with these models, and part of what makes it complicated is is like you said, like there everybody is is able to make them. Um, there was a, an article in the New York Times last week or the week before about Nano GPT, um, which is basically a GPT model you can train, you know, in an hour on your desktop, right? And um, when the technology is is that accessible, it's it's very hard to um, to think about you know regulating it or um, uh, controlling it in, in any way. But I think that, th that those are important concerns. Um, and there's certainly important concerns that people want to use this in, in, in a, um, you know, in, in an applied setting. Um, 
so I, I, I think that, you know, I, I agree with him on, on all of those kinds of concerns. Also, I guess, concerns about, about taking people's jobs, right? So, um, um, you know, there's, there's lots of jobs probably that, that, that can be replaced by this. And um, the people who are making these technologies, I don't think, are thinking through the societal consequences of, of uh, what, what that will be. Um, all, all of that said, you know, I, I, I think that the... Um, uh, uh, on the the kind of language science side, right? Like I, I think that that there there's really interesting questions um, uh, about understanding, for example, um, where uh, I actually think that that um, these models probably have some form of understanding, and in fact, their form of understanding is probably a lot like our form of of understanding. So, um, in collaboration with uh, Felix Hill, who's a researcher at, at DeepMind. Um, we wrote this paper on um, maybe about a year ago on um, uh, kind of understanding and concepts in in these models. Um, so one intuition a lot of people have is is that to really understand something, you have to know about the physical referent of the thing, right? So if you really want to understand, um, uh, what was our example? We had an example of a postage stamp. <laughs> okay, if you really want to understand a postage stamp, um, you have to be able to to pick out the physical thing and know kind of physically what it looks like. Those are kind of the the defining features um, of the term. Um, and what we argued actually is is that, that there's this uh, kind of longstanding um, uh, approach in philosophy of mind and and philosophy of language, which says it's not really the physical things that that define our concepts. It's really the relationships between concepts. Um, so, for example, uh, um, what def what makes something a postage stamp is something like it's you know a, a thing that you pay for and put on a letter so that the government will deliver the letter to some address. Okay, so um, you know almost sort of definitional, but um, um, uh, you know certainly some relationship among those those pieces. And if you think about that that definition, you, you could probably imagine. Um, uh, types of, of postage stamps which don't physically exist, but which everybody would call a postage stamp, right? So, for example, um, a postage stamp that was made out of glass. You could imagine some country somewhere, you know, decided that they were going to issue glass postage stamps and little, like, microscope slide covers or something, little thin pieces of glass you could attach to a letter. Um, and um, that kind of example, right, is, is one where um, it matches, it can match all of the, the uh, kind of definitional, relational types of properties. It's something you pay for and you'll attach it to a letter, uh, but it's a physical instantiation of a postage stamp you've maybe never even thought about before. So if you can think about it and agree that would be a postage stamp, even though it's a physical thing you've never seen before, that tells us that the physical part is not the part that defines the concept, right? It's much more likely that the thing that defines the concept are, are these relationships to, to other concepts. Um, and those relationships, what we argue, are exactly what large language models have. So um, they know that you should do that with a postage stamp, and um, they could maybe even reason a little bit about situations in, in which um, you know you had to pay for a postage stamp or, or what somebody would be likely to do with one or something like that. So even though they, they don't know anything about the physical grounding of those concepts, they still know the relationships, and, and we argue that, that, that that's a uh, really compelling picture of, of how human concepts and human beings meanings work. So, um, um, you know, th this is, I guess, getting back to your very first question about these things being philosophically profound, like, um, I think that they they really are because they, they force us to, to think about these kinds of questions, like, what do we really mean by meaning? Or what do we really mean by, by grammar? Um, and they show you a system which um, seems to have lots of those aspects, right? Lots, it knows a lot about grammar and it knows a lot about meaning in this sense of, of relationships. Um, and maybe that's most of, of what meaning is to us. Do you see this as a step towards AGI, artificial general intelligence? Are we there already? Are we kind of knocking at the door or are we now just kind of really starting to understand how kind of powerful computers have become because they now speak our language? I mean, until now you had to code, like I can't code, but like now I can actually kind of prompt it in, in, in my own language. Um, so where do you stand on this kind of AGI spectrum uh, debate? I mean, I think it's a very exciting time. Um, I think that um, large language models in particular, but but deep learning in, in, in general um, are just a huge advance over uh, the state of the field, say 10 or 15 years ago. Um, 
where people knew some of these kind of pieces and were kind of hopeful that the pieces could be put together in a in a useful way. Um, but now there's systems which uh, um, you could demonstrate work well, um, and they work you know better than pretty much any system on pretty much any language task you 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 want to find. So translation or parsing. Um, uh, or question answering or converting between language and code or, or any of those kinds of things. There just aren't other competing models which, which can do this. So um, from my point of view, you know, the, um, the advances that have been made over the last, say, 10 years in, in language models are a huge step towards artificial uh, intelligence, artificial general intelligence. Um, um, but they're not quite there yet. Um, and they're not quite there yet, probably be, be because of, of this, this issue that um, these models engage in kind of one very specific mode of reasoning, which is tied to language. Um, and humans seem able to, to reason and think about the world in a variety of, of different ways. So um, I, I, don't think it's, um, I don't think it's going to be that hard to incorporate uh, reasoning in, into these models. Um, and um, or you know more sophisticated kinds of, of representations of the type that that people have, um, um, and so that 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 makes me think that that uh, AGI is is probably probably very close, um, due in, in large part to to these these kind of recent advances. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the, the other thing I've learned from these models is that I have no ability to predict anything <laughs> about uh, <laughs> what will what will happen in the future. Because if you had asked people 15 years ago, they, they would have said that uh, this approach, you know, couldn't possibly do do language or couldn't possibly capture uh, meanings in language or grammar. Um, um, and um, that that's, you know, a large part of, of what these models have shown to be wrong. Um, so. Um, I guess I'm trying not to make predictions, but I'm, I'm, I'm very, very enthusiastic about it. Great. Well, Steve, that was a fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Cool. Thank you so much for having me.